Now that we've talked about the pros and cons of synchrony, let's turn our attention to the pros and cons of asynchrony. So first we're going to talk about what is asynchrony. Asynchrony is, see, asynchrony is a means of concurrent programming where the caller doesn't block waiting for the callee to finish the computation. So again, the, the mental image you should always have in that case is like dropping a letter in the mailbox. You're not going to sit by the mailbox or by your, by your mail slot in your dorm or whatever waiting for the result to come back. Unlike synchronous calls, which go ahead and block the caller till the callee is done, asynchronous calls immediately return something called a future while the computation runs in the background concurrently. So I'll show this again. Watch the idea. You can see how it goes ahead and makes all these calls. The callee is off doing something in the background. The caller gets back something called a future, which you can then redeem at some later point to get the results. And uh, this in the, the, basically, that means that the caller is now independent, sorry, the callee is now independent of the calling thread's flow of control. And we've, we've talked about, you know, lots of examples of this, and the best ones are, are fast food restaurants, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into the concept of futures in just a bit. When the asynchronous computation completes, the future is considered to be triggered. And all that means is it's notified. It says, hey, you've got something. And, and you guys are all very familiar with the concept of triggering because you have that probably on your smartphone. When you get a text, it's going to beep. When you get a uh, email that shows up, you're going to get notified that an email has shown up. There's a bunch of different things that happen that notify you that something has arrived asynchronously. So you know, Facebook post, text message, email, all kinds of other stuff you could get that would be triggered when something finishes. So the basic idea is that you start an operation, you get back this thing called a future, the asynchronous call runs in the background, and then at some point you're notified and then you obtain the result. Now, depending on how you want to organize the client, the client may or may not block awaiting the results, depending on various factors. Usually you don't want the client to block. You don't want the client to have to wait you want the client to be notified that something's finished and then it'll go handle it because otherwise you're taking up precious resources, namely threads, waiting for these things to come back. There are times when you don't have a choice where you have to wait, but you'd like to try to minimize waiting as much as you possibly can. Good example of this approach would be Android. Android has a bunch of different concurrent programming models. It's got this thing called the handler messages and runnable framework or the hammer framework. It has something called the async task framework, which has been deprecated in recent versions. But in either case, the basic idea is you want to be able to have background operations that are running, doing blocking, up blocking tasks like downloading a file or uploading a file and so on. And when those operations complete, they notify the user interface without having the programmer have to manipulate threads or create threads or deal with handlers or deal with messages. All that stuff is handled for you by the underlying framework. So the way that the async task works, if you still use versions of Android that support it, is they execute long duration operations asynchronously in one or more background threads that come out of a pool of threads, which typically defaults to something like the thread pool executor with a pool of threads, like a fixed size thread pool or a, a dynamic size thread pool. Anything that blocks in these background threads, don't block the calling thread, the user interface thread, the main thread. So the calling thread doesn't get affected. It's waiting for users to interact with it through all the normal user interaction modes like touch events and so on. And when the background threads complete, then they will notify the user interface thread. Likewise, the background threads could tell the user interface thread, hey, I'm making some progress. I'm not done, but I'm 20% done. I'm 40% done. I'm 60% done. I'm 80% done. And now I'm done. So they can provide progress information. They can also indicate if something goes wrong, if there's an error. So the basic idea here is that these kinds of frameworks shield client code from the details of programming futures. That's all hidden from you by a framework that wraps around the concept of a future. Let's talk about the benefits or the pros of asynchronous operations. 
One nice thing is that they tend to make your code more responsive because the calling thread doesn't block waiting for the asynchronous request to complete. So it can go back and handle other things. It can be more responsive to other stuff. That's one definition of responsiveness, handling more than one thing without blocking. The problem is if you had one thread of control and it blocks, then everybody else is unable to make any progress. So asynchronous approaches let you be responsive while letting things run in the background. Asynchronous approaches can also be more elastic because you can take all these requests that are running asynchronously and hand them off to a pool of threads. And then you can let those threads do their thing under the pool. And if you've got lots of cores, the threads will run and you can make it so that they handle the blocking in a clever way to make them adaptive. And uh, this ultimately means that you can scale up better on the underlying multiprocessor cores. Keep in mind, again, we're, we're thinking about elasticity here being in the context of one process on one computer, not a cluster of computers, but still applies. You can scale up better. And uh, so we can leverage parallelism better in multi-core systems. As we talked about before, if, if you do, in fact, have a cluster, which many people do using programming tools like Sparks or Hadoop, then you can scale up and out. You can have things where you've got multiple cores per computer, per process, available to each process, and you have multiple computers. So you could actually make this thing really scale up and out. So scaling up means you get more cores or more faster cores. Scaling out means you have more computers with more cores and more, more faster cores. So you can basically get performance that really will be elastic. And that's when people think about cloud computing and elasticity and auto scaling. That's usually what they're referring to. Once again, everything's not unicorns and rainbows. So one of the problems with an asynchronous based approach to programming is the response times may be less predictable because of the inherent non-determinism of asynchronous operations. We talked about that a bit with Java parallel streams, where I talked about the fact that the apply phase wouldn't run in lockstep. It wouldn't always do the same thing. It was non-deterministic. And asynchronous models like Java Completable Futures take that to the extreme. Everything is meant to run in whatever order they happen to run in. And you may get things back in a very different order in which you invoke them. At least with Java streams, if you so desire, you can order the results to match the encounter order. Not always the best thing to do, but you can always, you can usually do that. With completable futures and other more inherently asynchronous approaches, it's just whatever order they happen to run in is probably the order you'll get the results back in, even if that's not the order you invoke them in. And keep in mind, this is a general problem with concurrency. It's not just a problem with asynchrony and not just a problem with completable futures. So because of this unpredictability, you can get results back in a different order than the original calls were made. If you do things that are synchronous and blocking, then the order the results come back will be the order you invoke them, which underutilizes parallelism usually, but at least it's ordered. Whereas with asynchrony, it's the other way around. You get things to run faster typically, but the order of the results may be different. So if you need ordering, you'll have to figure out a way to reorder stuff yourself. And another tricky thing about asynchronous computations is they're more complicated to program and debug because things are happening out of order. Another deeper problem is that the patterns and best practices of asynchronous programming are generally not very well understood. And so most people are pretty familiar with how to program synchronous code and how to debug synchronous code because we've been doing it forever. But asynchronous stuff takes a bit more time to get used to. So there's some articles you might want to take a look at. We'll, of course, talk about techniques for debugging these systems as well. And another, another big problem that you run into in certain languages, particularly languages like JavaScript, is they have the wrong abstractions for doing asynchronous programming. And that can lead to something that's commonly known as callback hell. And you'll, if you ever program with JavaScript with something called promises, you'll discover the, the fun of callback hell. Fortunately, Java Completable Futures has all kinds of clever ways to not have to deal with callback hell. In fact, it's, it's a very, very powerful set of abstractions that uh, I actually miss in other languages uh, and other con uh, concurrent programming models like structured concurrency, for example. Because of this, errors can be harder to track down because when you run the code, it may perform differently each time, which can always be a little confusing. Again, this is not just a problem with with uh, asynchronous programming, it's a problem with concurrent programming in general. So anytime you have things that are concurrent, it's often the case you'll have the same kind of thing. So just to kind of wrap up, 
Two things are necessary for the pros of asynchrony, asynchrony to outweigh the cons of asynchrony. One is that you darn well better get better performance. If you're going to go to all this trouble to be asynchronous and your performance is no better than if you were using a much more civilized synchronous programming model, like say parallel streams, which is much more civilized in a lot of ways, much more intuitive, you better get a win and the win had better be performance. And oftentimes that is the case. So oftentimes a an asynchronous way of doing things will be an improvement over a synchronous way of doing things, even a synchronous way of doing things with parallel processing. And secondly, we'd like to have the asynchronous programming model reflect the key principles of the reactive paradigm. And once again, we're fortunate that the Java Completable Futures framework does indeed have a nice mapping onto that. Java Completable Futures provides a nice asynchronous concurrent programming model that performs well and supports the reactive paradigm. And we'll talk more about that as we get further along. Be aware, however, that it's not the only model for asynchronous programming in Java these days. And there's also the reactive streams implementations like RxJava and Project Reactor, which we will talk about later, which in, at least for my money, often go even further in supporting asynchronous programming. Although, depending on your point of view, they can be a bit more, even more complicated to learn at first because there's literally hundreds of methods in their key interfaces and key classes, whereas at least the Completable Futures interface has about, or API has about 60 methods, whereas you'll find like 300 methods in the one that you get with uh, Reactive Streams. So we'll talk about all that stuff later, and that's the end of what we're talking about today.